here we go. So um, today we're going to have um, Daniel Wavern once we can get him um, logged in. So our cheese, I don't know if any of you could find it, it's um, the Syrah washed Daniel's artisanal cheese, which I'll just go and have things, is, is right here. Um, there. So you see this, whoops, there it is. This beautiful double cream cheese washed in this lovely mm. Syrah, and that's the Cote Bonneville Syrah. Uh, Daniel, who will tell you more about himself, is um, from a local family. They make uh, Ferndale Farmstead cheeses. Uh, their dairy families and their dairies in Mapton, or this area, are um, for milk. And then they bought a dairy um, over in Ferndale, Washington. And they, the whole dairy is dedicated to cheese. Over the vineyard. Okay. Well, first of all, now that we have Daniel, we have to say cheers yes, again. Cheers to Daniel. Where's Daniel? Yep. Another reason to drink. A. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> We're here for you. <laughs> so, we had to do the Syrah because of the cheese, and um, here it's pretty. And this has really been a fun project because Daniel and I, oh, I've been having fun with this. I hope you have too, Daniel. But um, did you just disappear on me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, um, we've been working at how do you get the color? He's done more work on flavor, but it's been, um, it's been a fun project. So we had to pair these two together. But then because we wanted to include a recipe and I don't know how to make cheese, uh, we've got this flatbread. So I'm glad. Now what I did, which I thought was pretty cool, I totally amped up the herbs in this. I forgot what the recipe said, but I went out, I just went out to the herb garden and said, we're gonna put all these in. So um, make some super versatile. And it took me less than a, like 45 minutes start to finish. So um, total win. So then we'll go to the vineyard. Dad, you are unmuted. Unmuted. You are. Go ahead. Okay, so um, can you guys we've hear been me? Following two vines through the course from um, I can't Bud hear you Swell, for some reason. Bud break, and um, I'm glad to see you, Daniel. But I'm supposed to talk about the vineyard, so. Yeah, we the can. Control panel is having issues. You can put the pictures up. Um, yeah, I will. I will. So, Dad, what do you want to see first? Whichever one you have first, the um, Syrah. Oh. <clears throat> Hold on, we'll go to Syrah. No, that's. Syrah, there you go. Okay, so. Um, when you look closer at each of those clusters, you see uh, little berries and then you see skips. And um, so it, it's not very robust at this point. And what's happened in that particular location is the wind really beats these vines up. And so during um, set, they're trying to get the job done, but the wind blows them apart. And so next week, you, uh, when we show how this is developed between then and now, um, some of those will fill out, but you also see misses. And so the weather is the uh, uh, element that tells us what's going to happen. And you see those little brown um, calyptras that didn't come off last time we talked about. Yeah, and what happens with these when these guys get stuck on the end is that it reduces the amount of pollen that gets um, that gets into the onto the berries so it reduces the fertilization like we talked about and you can see they're still sitting there and where they're sitting there are the berries that didn't get fertilized so so that's okay, the strong. we'll switch over to the cabernet okay here's the vine okay now the Cabernet, we're going to do, um, you're going to get closer on those clusters, right, Carrie? I have another picture for the cluster. You want me to show the cluster? 
There you go. Okay, so these are uh, further along. You don't see as many of the elements of uh, bloom. Uh, the berries have gotten underway. Next week, you'll see more uniformity, but um, there's a better set. The other thing that happened over on the left is um, right there where Carrie is circling, that wanted to be part of the cluster, but it never got underway. And so all those elements are gonna drop off. We call that shatter. And so um, that will be a void in the uh, potential that that cluster had started with, again, due to the wind, a lot of wind this spring. So that's the status of set right now. Okay, did you want me to show the whole cap vine or just the cluster? Sure. The other thing is, um, at this point, uh, the height of the shoots is significant because you want to have the shoot height at an average of about a meter tall or 40 inches. And some of them are taller, some of them are shorter. But that's the horsepower that's going to develop the fruit and ripen it. And uh, so if you have underdevelopment at this point, then you have a concern and you want to encourage it. Merlot this year has been lagging behind. And so we've watched it and we've given it extra water and it's coming around, but it just seems to be a little bit behind um, the rest of the varietals. Chardonnay is typically the leading element of um, each of the phases. And the Chardonnay set looks very nice. So we're good there. All right. Um. And then we did um, an extra foliar feed uh, so that we nourish the vines in the drip. We nourish them foliar. And uh, from time to time, we'll put granular on in the winter but it's all based on the soil sample and uh, how they're coming. Um, so Adresh, to answer your question, there are a couple different components to yield. One of them is, um, so we know how much, what kind of crop loads we'll get. One of them, which is now, we can see, is the number of berries. And then the next thing is how big those berries get. And how big those berries get is, is pretty important because volume is a ratio of the, you know, it grows cubically with your sphere. So if your berries are really small, I mean, if you have 10 berries that are tiny or one berry that's big, you're gonna have, you know, it's, it's not about, it's not just about how many you have. So for this first part of the season, the grapes are trying, the, because the grapes are the reproductive part of the plant, they will be growing the seed, developing the seed, and the berries will be growing and getting bigger. So when the seed coats harden and the seeds are ready to go be dispersed and carried off and, and when the seeds are ready, then your berry size is set and that is when you know, that's about two weeks before veraison. So end of July, beginning of August is when we'll come into lag phase. And that's when we'll be able to do things like, um, we'll be able to do a better job of, of yield estimation at that point. So if you really wanted to dial it in, you would do, um, you'd do cluster counts, you'd do berry weights, you'd do, um, and so you'd go through and measure those things and, uh, and see what kind, of, what kind of yield you're getting. So, Daniel, are you? I think I'm with you. Perfect. Hey. Yeah. I switched to the phone. I don't know what's up with my computer. It won't find my microphone, um, so I can't, I can't hear you guys, but um, the phone seems to work for the moment. All right. Well, if your phone works and we can hear you and you want to talk so I can eat this cheese. Awesome. Go ahead yeah, and for sure. The cheese. Thanks for the intro. I was um, thinking I was more prepared and would have less technical difficulties, but you guys found a, found a way to start without me and um, I certainly got started kind of uh, before the meeting, tried to get a plate together and do a little bit of a pairing. I'm mm. big on pairings. I really love um, enjoying kind of snacks throughout the day. 
and my diet is um, pretty sensitive, I guess. I've got sort of a sensitive stomach, so um, wine is definitely better than beer for me. I don't know why exactly, but um, beer is really not very agreeable with my system. I prefer wine, and um, I certainly prefer to snack kind of on cheese and fruit and kind of small bites throughout the day rather than the, the three square meals my, my parents raised me on. Um, and that's just sort of been something that naturally my body seems to have uh, kind of uh, gravitated to. And I chose a really cool career, luckily, as a cheesemaker that uh, seems to fit my diet and my lifestyle. So what's on your plate there? So what I've got today is, is uh, just a real simple pairing. I'll kind of tip the screen a little bit, but oh, too much. Um, I apologize if that's loud. Let me tip it back. This cheese that we have, I think you did a little bit of a preview on yesterday, but uh, I'll do my best to kind of zoom in on it. And uh, you can see at least the purple on the rind as it, as it compares to the, the nice yellow paste. And that's the Bonneville cheese that's washed with Syrah uh, from the Brule Vineyards from you carry. Um, and I'm pairing that with just some raspberries, very simple local raspberries. Uh, raspberries, one of my favorite fruits. And with cheese, I find especially creamy cheese, uh, that citric kind of sour tang um, is a nice contrast in your mouth with that, that kind of a coating of cream that comes from uh, the Bonneville in particular with this meal. And to bring those two together, um, I drizzled a little bit of honey on the side on the corner here. It's kind of wanting to escape, but um, I really just love something sweet to kind of go again with that creaminess and that sour and sweet is sort of uh, the third of five flavors. There's really five main flavors that um, our taste buds can experience. Um, and uh, I really think that sour and sweet go together really well. Um, a little bit of salt from the cheese kind of ties it all together. It doesn't have to be real complicated. So for me, yep, a couple honey sticks, Bonneville and, and some raspberries, about, about all it takes to make me happy. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, so we've talked a lot over the weeks about how you grow wine, how you make wine, stuff like that. But, um, and I think one of the cool things about working with us working together is that we do the whole berry to bottle process. You guys do the whole seed to cheese. Um, but for those of us, myself included, who aren't super familiar with all the steps of making the cheese, how do you, how does one make Bonneville, for example? Great question. Um, now, I won't get you know, too deep into all the chemistry behind cheese making, but I'm sure your audience can tolerate it. It's really a fairly simple fermentation. Cheese is a concentration of milk. That's one of the best descriptions I've heard uh, to kind of summarize how do you make cheese. Um, basically, you concentrate milk. And the way we do that is via a selective um, exclusion of the water phase in milk, which is whey. And everybody's kind of heard the, the classic um, child's tale of, of uh, Miss Muppet and her curds and whey. And curds and whey is uh, really, you know, what we use in cheese making and we're separating the whey from the curd. That's the essential kind of basis to the whole process. We're getting rid of that water phase to selectively concentrate fat and protein into cheese. And that's the, one of the most basic and easiest ways to understand what we're trying to do. And uh, we use cultures, which are live bacterial strains that are very um, traditional and used in um, cheese making for many, many hundreds of years, if, if, uh, if not longer, perhaps in some cases. But these naturally occurring strains of bacteria, similar to winemaking, yeast, um, ferment, and uh, basically convert the lactose sugars into, into uh, lactic acid. And that's the acid that drives the fermentation, which is cheese. Um, so pretty much uh, cheese is real simple, four ingredients, milk, salt, cultures, and enzymes. And those enzymes are basically the clotting um, culprit if you will. They're the coagulation culprit. The enzymes we add to milk are from the calf of a uh, stomach of a calf. 
originally, way back again, years and years and years ago, humans found that um, certain enzymes in the lining of mammals, particularly calves or, or goats, um, kids, the very small um, goats that are ba barely born are, are turning the milk from the mother into cheese in their stomachs using these enzymes. And accidentally we discovered that as humans and have been making cheese ever since with those simple four ingredients. So cheese is a beautiful fermentation, just like wine or beer, if that's your thing. Um, but certainly I, I grow up on a dairy farm and always wanted to stay involved with my family farm and the sort of the dairy uh, industry. Um, and the cheese industry was sort of a sect that I found to be very welcoming and, and also pretty, pretty art oriented. It's really an art like wine is at, at the highest levels. Um, and so the way we make the Bonneville is using a little bit of that art and a little bit of kind of that knowledge of the science of what is cheese. Cheese is fat and protein being concentrated again. So with Bonneville, I actually add cream from uh, the cows that, that we have on the farm. We use a mix of Jersey cow milk, which is known to be very rich, um, some of the tastiest, most creamy, delicious milk you can drink. And it's also known to be some of the best milk that you can use to make cheese. So just like different grapes produ produce a different juice, uh, different animal breeds produce a different milk. And for the purposes of cheese making or the fermentation, we use different um, sort of starting liquids uh, to go down different, different paths, if you will. Um, and Bonneville is a double cream cheese. So we take extra cream and add it to the milk of uh, these Jersey cows that we have to create like basically an ultra rich, ultra high fat, ultra decadent cheese that really um, complements the acidity of the wine with that, that creaminess, that fat. So then this is like, like wine, aging of cheese is, is important. So how long do you age this cheese? How long does it take for all the different steps? Bonneville's actually aged a relatively short time, only maybe two to four weeks. Uh, we'll keep it in our aging uh, room, which is an open air, uh, basically kind of mimic of a cave um, as best we can in a sanitary environment. We're mimicking sort of the cool, damp environment that you would find in a cave or in sort of um, a mountainous uh, um, type of uh, you know, cabin or something like this. It's a very damp environment. And we just hold it in that environment, kind of like a basement almost, um, for about two to three weeks. And that helps to sort of develop the rind, develop the flavor of the cheese, and allow the salt, which begins from the outside, to penetrate all the way through the cheese. And uh, again, that, that salt really unlocks a lot of the flavor. There is no cheese without salt. Um, so it's a really kind of critical aspect to get right, that balance of salt with the cheese. Um, and then the amount of time it takes to get through the cheese is sort of what I use to determine how long to age Bonneville, um, which I said, again, it's, it's relatively short, two to four weeks. The reason that is, is that fat, again, can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, extra fat is very nice in young aged cheeses, but it's also the source of bitterness as it gets over the hill in age and starts to um, become too old. So there are certain cheeses that you can age and they get better and better and better with, with time. We make several of the, those that you know get um, to their peak at around two years of age, but could maybe go seven, eight, nine and still be continually growing in flavor and, and becoming more delicious every year. The Bonneville is not one of these cheeses. Bonneville is a short-aged, semi-soft, and double cream cheese. And that cream, like I said, uh, while it's, it's a pleasant flavor at first, the, flat, the fat globules or the fat um, basically cells in the milk can become damaged on the outside of the membrane. And that allows the cells to be broken down by 
indigenous enzymes, which cause bitterness. So when you're tasting a cheese and that cheese is very bitter, I always like to use the example of brie because people know what brie is. And sometimes if you forget a brie in the back of your fridge for two months or so, and it's beyond date, but you still try it, you'll find that brie to be really bitter. And it might be really oozy and gooey. That oozy gooiness is the breakdown of the protein. Again, we keep talking about fat and protein. That's really all cheese is. Um, protein provides the structure. So when you've got a really gooey cheese, you've had a lot of protein degradation. And if um, you taste the bitterness in that cheese as well, that's the fat degradation. Um, so with so, Bonneville, we don't want to age it too long. So Adrish asked, I don't know if you can see the chat on your phone. So I'll... Oh, no, I can't. Okay, so Adrish wanted to know then, as a general rule, are softer cheeses higher in fat? Or it sounds like yeah. you said that's more protein degradation. How do you get higher fat or higher moisture? Yeah. Hmm. Higher fat or higher moisture that would usually create a softer cheese. Yep. Okay. So how does how do you control moisture if you can add cream? What are the ways you use? Um, aging is the best. Really, you can uh, the longer you age it out, it sort of drops the moisture into a acceptable range. And um, there's a few steps throughout the make process. We cut the cheese, and that's kind of where the curds and whey thing comes from, is at first it's a big jello-type mass, and we cut that big kind of jello block into curds and whey. And um, after that point, you know, we can cook it a little bit to cook a little bit of that moisture out, um, or you can basically uh, cut smaller so that each of your curds is able to expel whey more easily leading to a lower moisture cheese. When do you um, wash it with the Syrah? Do you go through the aging process and then wash it? Or is the aging? It's all throughout. Yeah, great question, Kathy. It's all throughout the aging process. So we begin washing it maybe two days after it enters the aging room. So maybe three days after it's been made. Um, the cheese is very white on the exterior and it absorbs the lease from the Syrah very well. It creates a beautiful kind of a dark purple stain really the first time. Um, but, and then as we age it and that sort of um, that wash wetness dries on the cheese um, and maybe after two or three days we'll wash it again. So all throughout aging three or four times at least um, we're washing the cheese continually. Cool. So how much, I don't know that I'm going to phrase this correct the right way. How much wine does it take to make the cheese or how much cheese do you get out of a gallon of wine? You know, it, um, it varies a little bit. I can't say I've got the perfect um, understanding yet as terms of that, but we're working on it. And it seems like a gallon of wine will make um, anywhere from 50 little wheels of cheese to somewhere to a hundred. Um, and it kind of depends again on, on the quality of the lease. Kathy and Carrie um, have both helped me to get this lease uh, that's very thick, very dark, very rich purple. And that was really the goal of this project. Um, it's hard to find wine that's finished that's strong enough to basically stain the cheese. Um, so working with Carrie, we were able to get this lease that's real heavy. And so a gallon of it goes a real long way um, and it, it does it, like I kind of been shown, it does a, a beautiful job in um, sort of changing that yellow to, to a deep purple in just a few washes, really. So Tony asks, what is washing? Is it just pouring it over? Does it sit in the wine? Like, what does that look like? What does it mean? I always kind of uh, compare it to East, doing Easter eggs. If anybody's done Easter eggs where you dip it in the dye for, you know, about 30 seconds, very similar timing to an Easter egg. We do about 30 seconds a wheel, and then we uh, um, kind of sit it on the rack, and that wine slowly drips off. And um, it just seems like it's about the same exact time as you would use the dye, whatever it's made of, um, to do Easter eggs. Okay, so um, Scott wanted to know, do you make the Bonneville or other cheeses at a specific time of year? And he says he's heard milk and therefore cheese varies on the year. But the funny thing about Bonneville specifically, and then I'll let you ask talk to the different times of year with milk, but Bonneville specifically, because we've found that the, the earlier in the 
process, you get more solids and the more solids we have in the wine, the, the better it stains the cheese. So there are definitely times of the year where we, the color changes because of the stage the wine is at, which is kind yeah. of cool. Yeah, this year, you know, it's been a real kind of a cool, you know, uh, like first full year um, in the spring has been a, a time where we made a lot of Bonneville just because Carrie had the lease. And as she was pulling it off of uh, the Syrah from last year's harvest, um, I had made the cheese basically um, as it became available. So it's definitely sort of a seasonal issue. Um, again, with that fat content, we don't want to make it and then age it for six or seven months for the fall. So um, if I run out by then and the wine is gone by then, um, it does have a limited kind of nature to its production, which makes it more special. Uh, most of our customers and, and folks have um, been able to deal with that seasonality. And it's one of the cooler parts of, um, you know, staying local and and working with what nature provides right here in Washington State. Mm -hmm. uh, different mm -hmm. times of the year, I'll do a peppered sort of version of um, this recipe, which is not double cream, but I'll add green jalapeno to the inside and rub it with red jalapeno on the outside. Um, so yeah, mostly I would say spring would be the, the prime time it seems like this year for Bonneville. Mm -hmm. So are there other cheeses that depend on the time of the year? Yeah, the Fuego is the cheese that I was just mentioning. That one's starting to pick up a little bit now here in the summer. Um, and the Fuego is uh, kind of a nice counter to Bonneville. Bonneville being that really cream forward, um, kind of uh, aromatic cheese, which is based on a cachota from Italy. Um, the Fuego is going to be closer to like a pepper jack, where it's got jalapeno on the inside and is a real nice spicy cheese and it's, it's a it's a pretty um serious spice it's definitely not um for folks that avoid spicy foods um you know it's it's one of those things that uh goes good on like a quesadilla or um on tacos or any kind of mexican food really but yeah kind of a totally different animal and and aimed at dishes that are you know made in the summertime either a sandwich um, on a picnic or, uh, like I said, a barbecue, kind of a cookout taco uh, grill night. It's, it's great on burgers as well. So um, I use that one more in cooking um, during those times of the year, whereas in the fall, when I start getting the mood for a nice red wine um, and we start having guests in the house um, and making, you know, sort of cheese plates like this, uh, I'll shift more towards the Bonneville and sort of that rich, richer, heartier type of cheese. So Adrish wants to know how many different kinds of cheese do you make? And also how did you learn and develop your, your skills? Too many uh, at this point, um, but I would say um, Italian style cheese, I make about eight different um, cheeses from very fresh mozzarella, um, through kind of middle-aged, like we're having, uh, this is called cacciotta in Italy, which is like a basket style, very young, semi-soft um, ranch kind of farm cheese, um, and all the way up to a two-year kind of Parmesan style. Um, and this last year, uh, in 2019, those kind of bookends on, on our Italian cheese spectrum, both took first place in the, in the US and North America, actually, um, at the American Cheese Society conference and competition, which is a pretty big deal for uh, the cheese world. Um, fresh mozzarella is really the, um, uh, you know, the love child of Italy's cheese offerings. Everybody loves mozzarella all across the world. We saw it in Korea. Um, being made in the U.S., by the way, and sent to Korea. Um, and it's, it's really in every country almost to some extent. And the people we work with from Italy that supply us the cultures and the enzymes, the rennet that I was mentioning earlier, um, work quite a bit in India and Russia, um, all in, in sort of selling mozzarella cultures for the world market. So Mozzarella is a very, very popular cheese, um, very competitive. We were very proud to take home uh, first place for our little mozzarella balls in water. If you see those little cherry-sized balls in water, um, we make that kind of cheese. 
and they, they go great this time of year. Tomato season's here. They really, they go pretty good, um, you know, with lots of different fresh stuff. So, um, I guess I've got a couple other questions, but um, should we clarify briefly when you say you make all these different kinds of cheeses, what's Ferndale, what's Daniel's Artisan, what's yeah, going work sure. together? So yeah, the Italian cheese line, that was the first project, which is Ferndale Farmstead. You, you may find that one in grocery stores um, around the Northwest. Fred Meyer, Costco has had it briefly in the past. Safeway is a great place to find it, um, but it's pretty widespread. We started that project five years ago, specifically to make Italian heritage cheeses. Two years ago, I started Daniel's Artisan, which is sort of my spinoff as a personal signature line where I make very special Pacific Northwest collaborations using uh, my experience over the last nine, almost 10 years now, um, making all different types of cheese, French, American, Swiss, and Italian. And um, actually just now starting to make um, a branch of cheeses in the Mexican family. My wife is Mexican. We're both from Sunnyside, uh, born and raised. And I enjoyed a very high level of Mexican cuisine growing up and have always wanted to contribute in some way um, to that kind of ethnic market. and. Uh, we've got a really, really nice set of cheeses, about five cheeses for that project that we're really just starting to get out in the market and carnicerias and small Mexican grocery stores um, currently. But yeah, we're always working on something new between all the lines. I would say I probably make a, uh, probably 15, 15 to 20 uh, sort of unique cheeses. Um, and that's that's quite a bit. As a cheesemaker, you really... Um, set out to maybe only make about three or four, but um, it's a difficult market. There's um, uh, a lot of uh, growth and demand, I think, um, that could that could help us have to make less cheeses. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So um, Ed wants to know where he says we've seen some of the cheeses at Met Market, for example, in Seattle, um, has not seen Bonneville. So do you know where, I mean, aside, other than getting it from the winery, which if anybody needs more wine, it's easy for us to put it in the box and ship it to you, or you can come pick it up. That works. Um, Kevin, we can send it to you in Minnesota. Because <laughs> I don't think, but where, if you're not coming direct to the, to the winery, Daniel, where do you get the cheese? You know, great question. It's mostly on the west side at the moment. Um, we typically do the farmers markets in eastern Washington, in Yakima and Richland. This year, obviously, that's not going to happen. So I, I would typically say if you're in the, the valley, um, other than the winery, if you're in Yakima or Tri-Cities, the farmers markets, one of the best places. On the west side, here on the coast, um, New Seasons Markets in Portland carries the cheese. And we're just really starting to get it into widespread distribution. But um, I believe Hagen's, uh, which is a grocery chain up north, um, Hagen Grocery is starting to carry it. And um, I'm not sure if Met Markets has picked it up yet. They are in conversations. Um, so hopefully over the next you know few months, uh, Met Markets may pick it up in, in certain locations. But um, Whole Foods, I know, is also just picking it up at the moment, along with Fuego and a special cheese we're making just for just for Whole Foods that I'm washing with beer. Um, but uh, yeah, Whole Foods may be a good place to get it here soon. Smith Brothers, yes, thank you, Rhiannon. Um, that is one of the best places to get it. They did a nice kind of a seasonal um, cheese of the month program using the Bonneville, I believe in June. Uh, or May, uh, might have been May, but that was a really cool deal. They they bought a whole bunch of Bonneville, and they actually I've got one of those um, kind of cheeses that that they had right here, and they sent a bunch of these kind of quarter wheels out um, to folks around the Puget Sound that are part of um, their dairy cooperative. Smith Brothers Dairy is a really cool family. Uh, farm operation as well that supports other local family farms and do old school kind of milk delivery right to your front door among other dairy products and, and other good food. Um, and before we leave that thread because we can get all these cheeses because obviously we talked to Daniel a fair amount if you guys want um, 
something like Fuego, which we don't carry all the time in someplace like Minnesota, we can, it might not be just in time, but we can work that out and make sure and, and help you get some. So, um, certainly. Daniel, how much um, milk does it take to make a wheel of cheese? Well, Bonneville is about a two pound wheel of cheese and it takes about one gallon of milk to make one pound of cheese. So on one wheel of Bonneville, there's about two pound, two gallons of milk, excuse me. Wow, so th that would be like whole milk? Is that what you start with? Yep, we start with whole milk, and then we actually add a little bit of cream um, to that whole milk. So this is a packaged cheese. Sorry, it's a little bit ugly, but for size, I guess you can see it's, it's, not, a, it's not a huge cheese. I've got big hands, but um, that's what a two pound wheel of cheese looks like, and that would be two gallons of milk, as you can imagine, instead, so. Um, and how milk. old are the cows when you, when they come into production for milking? You know, it's all a range. I would say probably our herd averages up to nine years old, but probably the, the herd average would be probably five to six years old. Um, we've got a little bit of, a, of an older herd, actually. Um, but anywhere from, I think, three years to nine, maybe even ten years would be kind of the range of ages on the cows. And does it does the milk vary as the you know grapevines as they get older? They say they're more mature. Does the milk vary in an older cow versus a younger? It does. Cow? Yeah, they call it uh, late lactation milk, and uh, the milk does certainly change after a certain number of days in milk, maybe two hundred days or two hundred fifty days. It really depends on the animal. Uh, but towards that end of lactation, the milk can become a little bit more difficult to work with for cheese making. And um, your seed to um, milk or cheese. So, Woody, are your cattle on um, pastures, or how do you feed them? Um, it's a combination. So, yes, this time of the year, uh, certain pens are able to go out on the pasture uh, that we have right surrounding the farm. Um, and then in the winter on the coast here, you know, for seven to nine months, depending on the year. Um, the ground is wet and, and saturated almost on a, on a daily basis with the rain. So the cows live in the barns during that time of the year, and we store the fresh grass in the summer and bring it to them in the barns so that so that uh, they can have you know a fresh feed source all through all through the winter. But yeah, right now May through September, sometimes through October, we're able to graze the cows out as well. Um, as feed them in the barns with a, a ration that's mm, specifically designed uh, by my father, who's a veterinarian, um, to meet the nutrient requirements of the animal, uh, especially for cheese making. So he's customizing and basically tailoring the diet for the cows to create a very rich, high fat, high protein milk that will be superior for cheese making, specifically. So, um, well, I read the question on what they eat because apparently we're going to have to come back to this. We also had a question from Ed earlier on what makes cheese need refrigeration or not? Moisture um, is the short answer. It's really a three pronged answer uh, moisture, salt, and pH, acidity. Those would be the three factors that are are analyzed to determine whether a cheese is shelf stable, as they call it, meaning it can be stored out um, in front of you at the grocery store without refrigeration. So cheeses like Parmesan, very high salt, very low moisture, high acidity, that is low pH, that represents a very safe product, basically bulletproof. Um, you can't get sick. There's never been a case in, in history of Parmesan as the source of a foodborne pathogen because they simply can't exist in its, in its paste. Even with all the sugar and the dairy um, aspect of it, the moisture is low enough, salt's high enough, acidity is high enough that um, it's shelf stable. Okay, so Tony says, I read somewhere that the Ferndale cheeses, which as an aside, Tony is so close to you, but just across the border. And oh. 
the border is closed, which is why he's drinking other people's wine and eating other people's cheeses. So as soon as that border opens, he's going to come down and visit us. He's bringing a 53-foot semi, <laughs> blowing that puppy up. <laughs> but he says he read or saw somewhere that with Ferndale, the cows eat special grasses, et cetera, depending on the flavors you want. So does your dad change the, the mix depending on what kind of cheese you're making? Does it depend on the time of year? How do you manage the nutrition of the cows? Well, Tony, I'd love to visit you too. I was actually just on the phone with my car dealer. I need a service and I get it done up in Vancouver and they won't let me in. So um, <laughs> I'm visiting your side soon enough as well. But um, great, great question. Bill, my father, um, really makes a high quality cheese milk that's suitable for all different types of cheese making. So we don't specifically tailor um, the milk tanks to like a certain cheese um, as we as we go through different cheeses throughout the week, we really just shoot for an overall, um, uh, the whole tank, you know, throughout the year will always be very balanced in terms of its fat and protein to make all different types of cheeses um, really well. And it's a balancing act, certainly. Um, certain cheeses may benefit from a lower fat content than what we like to use for mozzarella. Um, and on the on the on the same side, mozzarella can can be a little bit difficult if the fat is too high. So, um, mm -hmm. whenever you're making multiple products, especially traditional European style products, mm -hmm. um, the more you make in a certain building or in a certain uh, farm, um, the more you're going to probably have to make compromises because. As I look at the European systems, a lot of their systems of products, producing products, are oriented on creating an end product, like Parmesan or like the wine. Um, it's not that the, the, the product is made from you know, milk that's going to be made into fluid milk. No, the, the milk is made to make cheese specifically and has been for hundreds of years. So um, in the US, um, we don't have regionality like they have in Asiago, Italy, where everybody in the town of Asiago produces what cheese? Asiago. Um, we all make different cheeses and we compete with each other as neighbors. So um, that lack of regionality and identity as a young nation uh, uh, of food producers and artisans um, really makes us have to do more. We have to do a lot more because we're trying to do everything essentially rather than one thing. Um, and that's been one of the biggest challenges to the earlier question, how many cheeses do I make? Um, too many. Which I will echo that, that one of the, whenever people ask us, you know, or what, what new wine are you making this year? Or what, what's coming out new? It's, uh, I always want to say, no, you really don't want me to come out with something new and different every year. You want me to do the same thing consistently, not, so we do, which is why with train station, we play around with new things on occasion, but really consistency is, is not a hallmark always of, of what we do here. So it's, um, but speaking of Asiago, Ed says you're, he, they're eating the Asiago, the Ferndale Asiago right now. Oh, excellent choice. <laughs> so and i'm gonna i would guess no but kevin asks is the bonneville shelf stable um it is not shelf stable no it should be kept refrigerated um because of that high fat if, if you leave it out it will get very soft and you can kind of you can feel that and it'll make you a little nervous i would definitely keep it refrigerated it's one of the difficult parts about the wine club shipment unfortunately is it needs ice packs to do the best so um we can certainly ship it it'll it should come with ice most definitely uh, because again of that that high fat content it's a very delicate very decadent um very luscious cheese okay so drish asks is there a cheese or cheese style that is more suitable to the yakima valley washington pacific northwest you know drish not not necessarily again because our food production systems are oriented to produce bulk fluid milk um, and not any type of end cheese product mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily say that, that what we have here is, is particularly oriented to a certain product. If I'm being honest, um, certain people might try to romance you and say, oh, we should, we, we're from the valley and 
Um, so we should make a valley cheese that's hysterically made in the Loire Valley in France or, or whatever you have. But um, realistically, it, it, with my experience as a cheesemaker and sort of looking at the raw supply, which is the milk, um, the biggest differentiators are going to come from your, your feed, your forage. And uh, for us in the United States, that's a mix of alfalfa, corn, grass, um, and some supplements, but uh, like, like uh, distillers, grains, or, or whey. We actually use the whey from our cheese making process as part of our ration to kind of add moisture to the grass and the alfalfa that forms the basis of it. It's about 60 to 65% grass that makes up their ration. Um, but that's a monocrop grass. You know, it's a grass seed that we planted as farmers and that we harvest every year. And it's not very much like the meadows in France or Italy that would have produced, you know, historical cheeses like Gruyere or Parmigiano Reggiano or Gouda, whatever you have. Those cheeses were from animals that were grazing out on pastures that had nettles and flowers and weeds and grass. And the resulting milk and onions in certain cases and, and that kind of thing will transfer into the milk flavor and pass on stuff that um, you know a production dairy diet never will let's be honest so um you're talking about dairies that are for milk production now i know that the dairies that your folks run um that don't go to cheese are specifically are for milk, but I thought Ferndale was specifically all like all of it goes to cheese. So is the fat protein content of the milk higher? Is the are there differences in the way you manage the two herds? Yes, definitely. Um, so we work with within the sort of structure with, which is fluid milk production and, and sort of the farming uh, systems in the United States that that are associated with that and produce like a very rich milk. So very high fat, high protein milk. Um, but in terms of flavors, um, you know, we're really relying on the cultures from Italy to provide us a unique identity of flavor. One of the biggest kind of challenges as a cheesemaker, other than, other than finding a position on my phone where I'm not getting glare for you guys, is, uh, is uh, the fact that our ingredient, one of our key ingredients, the culture, can really only come from about three or maybe four suppliers or sources. And those sources often share the same strain of bacteria, which has then very similar flavor producing characteristics. So one of the biggest plagues of American cheese in, in my um, uh, opinion is that, you know, we're all having different farms and different herds and different cows, but then we put the same strain of bacteria in the milk to make the cheese. So all of our cheeses, all of our breeds from all of these different farms have sort of a similar sameness, if you will, to them. That uh, European products, you know, we, we love them because they're uniqueness from each other, seasonally even, uh, and farm to farm. So um, we really tried hard. I really believe in, in trying very hard to find unique uh, ingredient suppliers. And we were very lucky to find Raffaele, uh, my mentor, who was from Naples originally and grew up making cheese and lived half his life until he was 28, my age, um, in Italy, and then moved back to Wisconsin to marry his American wife and spent the next half of his life uh, making cheese in the heartland of American cheese. So um, he's got a very unique kind of experience of both scale and the artisan touch uh, that he grew up in. And um, he's able to connect us with suppliers back in Napoli, where we we're able to get our cultures from a very small culture house and our rennet from that same uh, supplier. And those are primarily used for the supply, the producers of mozzarella and Italian cheeses in southern Italy, really the epicenter of um, Italian cheese making. So that unique kind of uh, ingredient supply, I would really highlight as one of the, you know, the biggest differences in what you're tasting when you buy our cheeses, whether it's Ferndale Farmstead or Daniel's Artisan or Familia, um, we use those Italian cultures across the board and it gives us, I think, a little bit of an edge in flavor, even when we're making something like Asiago, which is made by lots of folks all across the world. Okay, so we've got 
a couple different, I'm getting lost here. Okay, so um, Paul has questions on uh, vegan cheeses, nut, like nut cheese. How do you make non-dairy cheese? Would you, I'm gonna guess you wouldn't, but would you ever? And, uh, and how do, yeah, how do you make, how do you make vegan cheese? Good question. I saw Raphael, um, uh, question about Raphael. I'm answer that real quick. He's in Wisconsin, Green Bay. Um, he's working at projects all over. He invited me to India, actually, the last time we spoke to visit him with his current project in India. Um, but he's not making cheese under any specific label in Wisconsin at the moment. He's a consultant, so travels all across the world, um, really promoting the cultures um, for Luigi, um, his colleague in Italy. Um, but then the nut cheese question, we get that cheese question quite often and I'm actually certainly less opposed than my father would be my, my father's a big um, dairy dairy foods and, and milk guy you know, till he dies I'm sure but um, you know I'm part of the the newer generation and I certainly see my friends making um, we'll say interesting choices with the milks and uh, other foods that they purchase uh, um, cheese which is kind of a you know it's a debatable term for uh, nut cheese I I've actually coined my own though, so I've given it a little bit of thought at least, but I think a better term would be vega pate. Um, vega pate is something like vegetable based or, or vegetarian pate, which is a paste. And that would be what I would make, would be um, you know, a pate of, of sort of seed origin um, to meet that market. I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to it. I think it could be a cool product, um, certainly fitting a niche. So thank you, Adrish. I definitely. Oh, no, that's a drift. That sounds better than nut paste. <laughs> so I don't know if you saw Drish's earlier question, um, which I think is really funny considering you said um, your mentor went to India. Drish asked, "What's the easiest cheese to make?" And we had actually made paneer, which is the only cheese I've ever made. So then the question became, "What is the second easiest cheese to make?" Oh, good question. You know, everybody says mozzarella is the easiest cheese to make. I beg to differ. It is, for me, the hardest cheese to make. In my last five years, specifically with this project, I have had more headaches, more tears, and more frustration with mozzarella than I could ever explain. Um, it's a very difficult cheese to make because in the U.S., everything is oriented for shelf life. We want to make a fresh cheese that lasts over a month. Ours has 35 days currently on it as a shelf life. And I say that with a lot of pride and a lot of pain. Um, but typically in Italy, mozzarella is a five day product at most. It's meant to be con you know, made, consumed the day of, the day after, or the day following. Um, but our system of food distribution in the US is a little different with warehousing and, and trucking distribution. Um, often it's in that stage for weeks before it reaches the shelf where it may stay for again weeks before the customer picks it up and, and takes it home. So <laughs> uh, it is absolutely the bane of national food supply and especially here in America. But um, we're working on that. Regional food systems are getting stronger um, and that's sort of the whole goal with Daniel's Artisan Project is you know highlight what we have right here and hopefully that will be the best way to lead people towards um, spending their money here rather than, than across the pond. All right, and then Scott asked about ricotta. How hard or easy is ricotta to make? Oh yeah, I didn't answer the question, did I? I would say, you know, paneer might be the easiest cheese to make. I don't know, there's, there's no such thing as an easy cheese to make. That's the truth. I, I don't know one. Cheese is just a terribly difficult uh, endeavor, but um, ricotta is, again, it's a, it's a hard cheese to make. Um, because they use steam at 190 degrees direct injected to the whey to precipitate the last remaining protein, sort of like the Eskimos use every part of the whale, the Italians use every part of the milk, including the whey, which is typically discarded or fed to the animals. You lost your phone. Scott, I'm glad you asked that question. I did not know how they made ricotta, and that's a, I was not expecting that answer. So Mike, you're a dairy, or dairy vet, or you do those cows, so what aspect do you do? You do um, nutrition, or uh, what, 
what's your area of expertise? Herd health. Probably. Herd yeah. health? Herd health, more of herd health. Yeah, I, I worked with uh, Daniel. See, can you hear me? Two years. Give me a thumbs up. Yep. <laughs> All right. I'm going to keep talking. I can't hear you on my computer still, but um, yeah, my phone timed me out there. I'll, I'll charge it and see if I can get going. But um, what was I speaking about? What was I speaking about? Ricotta. Um, the easiest cheese to make in ricotta. Ricotta is, yes, injected with steam directly into the whey to precipitate out the last little bit of the protein, as I was saying, to use every usable and saleable part of the product. And so it's an extremely sweaty cheese. Um, these cheesemakers in Italy that are making ricotta are leaning over a big open vat at a 180 to 190 degrees with steam bubbling out of it. It's, it's a terrible product. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Okay, so Mike was telling us he's uh he, Oh, the Weedums are here. I didn't see you. Sorry, I can't hear you guys, but here, we'll now I can see yeah. everybody. Yeah. Good to see everybody. Thanks for everybody for, for yeah. Do we have any more questions? Thanks for putting up with my bad audio. Because I think Daniel can see the chat. So, I mean, we're coming up on six o'clock. I don't know what everybody's time frame is, but uh, we can. Well done, Daniel. Well done. Um, let me just tell Daniel what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Anyway, if we have if we have any other questions, go ahead and ask them in the chat because of our technical difficulties. And uh, otherwise, we're just about at six o'clock. So yeah. So this week was all about cheese. Next week um, is all yeah. about grapes. Yeah. Okay. I'm super excited because my um, yeah. one of my professors from uh, UC Davis is going to come talk to us, and Andy is one of my favorite lecturers. He, the class I took was technically ampelography, like grapevine identification. But I mean, he changed the way I think about grapes and how grapes come from, how you, how and why you would put blends together. Um, like just why certain things work in viticulture. Like he completely is just fascinating. So put your seatbelts on. He is a fire hose when he talk of information when he talks. Take notes. We're gonna have a quiz. <laughs> there will be no quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're taking notes. That's fantastic. But um it'll be super fun. Oh look at that. I, I do I take notes. <laughs> I, I do so glad you guys are all learning things and having fun and uh, and this um, next week I forget whose idea it was I can't but next week uh, it was I think it was Robin's idea so thanks for that but if you guys have anything that you're super curious on feel free to let me know because uh, we're st I'm still asking people so this is a a, a collaborative effort. We're all about teamwork and collaboration. So, so they wouldn't know what kind of cheese you get at the winery. Like yeah, Daniel's right. We have Bonneville. We carry the Bonneville. Uh, we have it most of the time, if not all the time. Um, and then we we can, we can get the others. We can get the Ferndale. Like the, yeah, we can the get other, anything. Uh, we can get anything Daniel makes. So or Ferndale, I guess. Yeah. And Daniel's talking, but he's not saying anything. Oh, now we can't hear you, Daniel. Hold on. <laughs> there you can now, right? Yeah. Yeah. You were muted for a second. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm back on the phone. I'm just saying, yep, I'm back in the valley about every other week. So um, just let Carrie know and, and I'll get her some cheese for sure. Thank you all for um, enjoying the, the chat here. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, well, every, <laughs> yeah, everybody can go visit him in Bellingham and uh, we will see it. Daniel, thanks for, thanks for joining us. We love the cheese. It's delicious. Yep. And uh, we will see you all. We love those cow vets to keep those fit herd all healthy. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy cows make good cheese. That's the key. Happy That's cheese right. make good people. That's what it's all about. Thank you all. Uh -huh. There you go. All right. All Take right. Care. Thanks, guys. Have a good weekend. Have a good week. Mm -hmm.